Hi, my name is Dr. West Bishop with Super Corporation, and welcome back to the Algae Corner. Today we're going to cover changes to types of algae in water over time. This is called succession. And then we're going to delve into some of the primary factors that may govern the type of algae you may have at a given point in time in your water. Factors like light, temperature, mixing, nutrients and nutrient ratios, and many other water chemistries can all impact the types of algae you will have and the densities they can achieve in your specific water resource. Now it's very complex to predict what type of algae you're going to have, uh, especially what's going to be present at a certain point in time as all these variables can interact with each other. But here we're going to give some broad overview information on algal types and water bodies and what may impact their presence and dominance at different times of year, what we're calling succession of algae. Now the first topic we're going to discuss is changes in nutrients. Now nutrients come from many different sources. Large flushes of nutrients may enter water bodies uh, from fertilized fields such as golf courses, agricultural lands, just lawns that have been fertilized that that fertilizer can run off into a water resource. Uh, faulty septic systems can also be a large contributor to nutrients into lakes, for example. But there are many natural sources of nutrients, such as leaves, uh, grass, wildlife excretion. Geese, remember, can poop, poop a lot and contribute a lot to nutrients, but even, even domestic pets like dogs, if you don't clean up their poop, it can end up into a water resource and contribute a lot to nutrients. Now, stormwater management is important. Managing nutrients external from the water body that may enter the water body is very important to keep them out, but these nutrients often accumulate in these systems, can build up through time, and can wreak havoc based on this buildup of nutrients. Now this process, this accumulation of nutrients in a water resource is called eutrophication. Again, this is the aging process, the natural process of nutrients coming into a system and supporting more growth. Now, human activities have greatly impacted this process, greatly accelerated the eutrophication process, and we're certainly seeing the ramifications of that in nuisance and noxious algal blooms. So even if you're able to offset all these nutrients coming into a water resource, there's already enough built up in many systems to support nuisance algae moving forward. So basically, just management of external nutrients may not be enough, may not support the changes in water quality that you want to see in your site. Uh, nutrients in those sediments are very critical and very important to nuisance algae ecology. These can be more available different times of year. In summertime, for example, under hot stratified conditions, nutrients may get released from the sediments. And cyanobacteria, those nuisance noxious organisms that can produce toxins, can access these. They can move up and down in the water column. They can get down near their sediment water interface and access some of these nutrients, these legacy nutrients that have accumulated in the water resource, they can uptake them and they can use them to grow. So again, offsetting nutrients is important, but certainly doesn't mean you won't have any algae and certainly doesn't mean you won't have these nuisance or noxious types of algae. Many cyanobacteria can also fix atmospheric nitrogen. Now this is 78% of the air we breathe it is, is this nitrogen gas and cyanobacteria can harness that and use that. They have these specialized cells that can break that nitrogen into forms and use it in their building blocks. Now it took humans a long time to figure out how to do this very energy expensive process, but cyanobacteria have it down. So it's very difficult to make nitrogen limiting to many cyanobacteria. So uh, even though nutrients are very important in shaping the types of algae you have, there are certainly many algae that grow in low nutrient envi environments. Uh, even bad cyanobacteria blooms can happen in low nutrient environments because of their unique acquisition strategies to access nitrogen and even phosphorus buildup on the bottom of the system. So keep an eye on nutrients, but they can be tricky in deciding what type of algae you may or may not have. Now the next factor we're going to talk about is temperature. Now some algae prefer cold temperatures. You'll only find them in cold temperatures and they dominate in these lower temperature environments. Now these can be things like diatoms. For the most part, diatoms are good for a system. And there are many green algae that like a little bit cooler temperatures uh, as well. There's even algae that grow on snow and there's algae that bloom under the ice. However, other algae like cyanobacteria often prefer hot temperatures. They dominate in these hot conditions. They have a very high growth optima for temperature. Now they they do grow in a lot of other environments, but in general, in these hot, warm conditions, cyanobacteria, the dominant algae, 
you may have, and that could be independent of nutrients and nutrient types. So just because it's cold doesn't mean you have one algae. Uh, typically, the populations are more diverse in cooler environments. They don't get as dense, but in cold environments, you may have more types of algae, but certainly in the warmer environments, you may select for one or two types of noxious cyanobacteria, for example, that dominate and can achieve much higher densities or biomasses. All right, now light intensity is the next factor we're going to discuss. Now light intensity often correlates with temperatures, but it can impact algae in different ways. So more light often fuels more algal growth, but too much can actually hurt algae. So increased ultraviolet light or UV rays uh, may negatively impact some types of algae like diatoms. They have a hard time dealing with those types. Um, whereas cyanobacteria actually have some sunscreen built right in. They have pigments in their mucilage called skytonemin that protects them from these harmful UV rays. They also have microsporin-like amino acids built right into their cell walls, and this is what we use in sunscreen to help protect them from UV light. So later season, higher light intensities, higher UV light, some cyanobacteria may actually dominate because this UV light can impact other algae greatly, whereas cyanobacteria are able to withstand it. Now, light intensity and temperature are the primary driving forces governing the growth cycle of algae. There are likely algal spores or reproductive st structures already in your system, especially if you've had historic blooms. So common summertime algae may overwinter in the sediments. They have these specialized resting stage cells called aconites that allow them to withstand some of the cold, uh, harsh environmental conditions. But when things are right, when temperatures warm up, when the light intensity improves, these can bloom, these can pop out and form some of those summertime blooms that you typically see. Now we have a diagram of a life cycle here. When things cool back down again or conditions get unfavorable, they may go back into those protective resting stage, stage cells in the sediments and then again pop up next year when things, things get more conducive for their growth. Now another factor we, we need to discuss today that can impact algae and impact their ability to dominate your system is the mixing of the water. Now, mixing of water can occur naturally through wind action, through fish stirring up the water, or it can occur artificially. Uh, subsurface aeration systems, fountains, other mixing systems are often added to a water body or pond for many good reasons. So mixing can have benefits, like adding more dissolved oxygen to the water, but can also impact the algal assemblage in many different ways. Some algae like diatoms prefer being mixed up. They have the silica outer wall and makes them very heavy and they tend to sink. So by mixing them up, it gets them in the photic zone. They tend to dominate the algal assemblage more, and this could be very beneficial for your system. Uh, mixing also adds dissolved carbon dioxide to the water, and this is a form of carbon that diatoms need to grow. Uh, other algae can use it too, but diatoms prefer this form. So again, mixing can help select for these more beneficial algae in many scenarios. Conversely, mixing may select away from some of those cyanobacteria, those toxic scum forming cyanobacteria forms. Uh, these guys have gas vesicles that they use to adjust their buoyancy, and if you mix them up, they get all confused, so they have a harder time popping up and forming those scums in a highly mixed environment. Also, bringing up this cooler, deeper water often lowers the temperature of the water. So again, those cyanobacteria don't do quite as well in the cool temperatures, whereas the diatoms and some green algae actually like the cooler temperatures. So by mixing, you may indeed keep that overall water temperature lower, prevent stratification of the upper layers, which may warm faster, and thereby offset some of those cyanobacteria from dominating in the system. Mixing can also add oxygen to the water, Keeping oxygen near the sediment water interface may keep some of the nutrients bound up in non-bioavailable forms and not, again, be re-released -re out of the sediments, out of those legacy stores where nuisance algae can go down and get them. So mixing is important and mixing may be beneficial, uh, though unfortunately in late season warmer conditions, uh, mixing may also select for some nuisance types of cyanobacteria. Uh, again, unfortunately, there are some planktonic cyanobacteria like Slingospermopsis and Planktolingbia and Sudanabina that like being mixed up, that can scavenge phosphorus and nutrients, that can fix nitrogen, and actually do better in mixed conditions. So be careful. There are some generalizations about mixing and selecting away from cyanobacteria, but there are many cyanobacteria that may enjoy these conditions and certainly may still dominate, especially later in season as things warm up. 
So to recap, there are many factors that impact the types of algae in your system and how that may change throughout a season, either over years, uh, through natural aging, or even over decades, these types of algae can change. The factors are complex, they're interactive, and there's many factors governing the algal assemblage at a given point in time. Nutrients, nutrient ratios, temperatures, mixing are some of the primary factors we discussed today, but there's certainly others. So thank you for your time, and be sure to keep a close eye on your lake or pond as things are constantly changing. Contact us if you want to learn more about addressing nutrients that have built up in your system or look at options for directly controlling nuisance algae or blocking sunlight penetration into the water. And as always, for more information, please visit the link below or contact us.